university ranks. Students say that in terms of being a great combination of community, social, and academic experience, University of Waterloo is your best choice. Overall, the university is one of the best 15 universities in Canada, especially in the field of social science, business, medicine, and engineering, of course. At the end of today's meeting, there will be a session for questions and answer. If you have any question, please write it down in the chat box and a queue and answer question. Now we are pleased to have Mr. Hisham Ahmed, General Director of Dispatch and Academic Supervision Department, Central Department of Egyptian Mission affiliated to the Ministry of Higher Education and Scientific Research in Egypt who will present to us the Egyptian state plan for grants and mission. Welcome, Mr. Hisham, the floor is yours. Uh, Dr. Ahmed, thank you very much for such introduction. Uh, I do appreciate uh, the attendance in uh, this webinar with Waterloo University. Waterloo University is one of the famous universities uh, all over the mission department, as it had a lot of uh, um, alumni from the Egyptian scholars all over the public, our public universities. Uh, let me share with you the presentation, and I meant to buy the presentation to give an idea to our partners, uh, an idea about our uh, unified uh, announcement and how we uh, work it out. Uh, as you know, the Central Department of Mission um, is the main department that's taking care of all uh, scholarship that provided by the Egyptian government, as well as it is the main central department that receives all grants from, uh, from all over the world and distributed through the public universities, as well as the public uh, research centers, as well as uh, controlling uh, the grants for um, the undergrads the undergraduate students, as well as, as the private sectors. Okay, and we usually uh, have authentication from our main boss, which is uh, the CDM Executive Committee. It has, um, it have a lot of uh, um, members. Uh, most of these members are decision makers, like uh, uh, our minister, Minister of Higher Education and Scientific Research, and we are having the Supreme Council of Universities uh, uh, president. We are having the, um, the main uh, uh, the, um, culture affairs and the mission uh, director, uh, Dr. Ashraf al -Zazi, and the staff of the CDM. CDM announced twice um, annually, uh, usually in late January and late June. And the scholarship usually, um, we specify its priority areas or the specialties that we are targeting through our announcement, through a plan upon the priority areas that will impact the Egyptian economic growth. Usually this decision is already um, um, discussed and uh, planned for almost like an, um, the coming five years. Uh, within a lot of communities, like the Supreme Council of Universities, the public universities itself, the um, um, Ministry of Planning, Ministry of Finance, a lot of uh, stakeholders already sharing into uh, this vision. Okay, what type of scholarships that we are providing in the mission department? We are um, providing uh, full PhD up to four years. We are providing one year channel system or joint supervision system scholarship. We are providing up to six months uh, postdoctorate scholarship. And currently, we are providing uh, in this uh, announcement a two years master degree. However, what we are uh, giving or what, what we are covering in these scholarships. For the PhD, we are covering our participant with two round trip tickets, airfare tickets. We are providing him with monthly flight. We are paying his tuition. We are providing um, the, uh, the funds for the, his medical health insurance. We are paying him one month paid leave during his uh, PhD journey. 
of course, every year we are giving him book allowance and clothes allowance. In the joint supervision, as it is one year, we are giving him one round trip ticket. We are paying the 12 months as a stipend. We are paying his research fees if he needs research fees, medical health insurance, and we are giving him 15 days paid leave, uh, but without uh, airport tickets. Also, we are giving him a book and those allowances. However, for the master degree, we are preparing a ground trip ticket. If his master, if the master's duration was just months, just happened for 12 months. However, if it is 24, 24 months, up to 24 months, we are paying the 24 months. The search fees, of course, and the stipend we are paying, medical insurance coverage, we are giving him 15 days annually um, without uh, airfare tickets, book allowance and closing allowance. And for the most of it, of course, we are paying ground trip tickets, monthly stipend for six months, and the medical insurance coverage. Okay, so what are our scholarship scope, or what are the main core fields that we are dealing with? We gather them and collect them in main 10 core um, um, measures. The energy includes, which includes the, all the uh, departments of the College of Engineering and Science, and all the disciplines affiliated with the research of developing solar and bioenergy. We are providing water, we are requesting for water, water resources, and medical and health sciences, agriculture and nutrition science, environment, and strategic industry techniques, the information, communication, and space technology, education and learning development, and investment, trade and transport, and social humanities uh, science. Okay, so our announcement timeline goes like this. The first, the first option is we already published on March 21st, uh, and the deadline of the announcement will be May 30th. We are going to check the eligibility, and if the eligibility was fine, so we finish by June 6th. By July, we are going to have the technical evaluation to the proposal submitted by the participant, as well as uh, performing the uh, personal interview for each uh, individually uh, for each uh, participant. Um, the review panels are consisted of uh, a lot of uh, Egyptian uh, professors, uh, usually their index, uh, um, index uh, as a scholar, so it's over uh, grade five. Uh, we ha had, um, or we had a lot of, uh, uh, of, uh, of professors in our database that had been um, uh, evaluated as very good professors, so to give very good chance uh, for each participant. By August 2021, uh, we should announce the results. Okay, after the results had been revealed and authenticated by our Excellency, His, uh, His Excellency, the Minister, we delivered these results to ECAP with the related information of the participant who won these scholarships. They go for the placement. And the ECP takes the role of negotiating with the hosting uh, university uh, for the uh, tuition, uh, for the research fees, and the whole related uh, items for the scholarship. They inform, usually the ECP contact directly with the participant. The participant had to fulfill all the requested um, requirements by the uh, hosting university. Once they fulfill it, ECEP uh, to confirm the CDM with the final acceptance. Then we start our role in Egypt by preparing the participant to finalize his pre travel orientation and the requested courses, as well as his paperwork. Some of the paperwork could take more than three months. And uh, uh, if you can, the Waterloo University 
could be patient with us because I understand that a lot of uh, professors already um, uh, well rejected the proposals uh, to our participants because of the late uh, paperwork submission. Uh, we need your tolerance in this one. Once the the, the CDM finalize its uh, traveling pre travel uh, procedures with the participants, usually CDM dispatch him to uh, the hosting university, and here comes the role of ECP to monitor his uh, education. Okay, and uh, that was a quick uh, points about uh, the announcement. And of course, we are open for all questions. Uh, and if you can uh, check our website, cdm.edu.eg, we are having the link in uh, and our email and our YouTube channel. Thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Ahmed, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Hisham. Um, now I would like to welcome Professor Ahmed Fauzi, the cultural attaché and the director of the Egyptian Culture and Education Office. Professor Fauzi will take us on a journey through the role of the Egyptian Culture and Education Office in Montreal. Professor Fauzi, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Ahmed. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> on behalf of the Egyptian Cultural and Educational Bureau, in Canada, it is with my tremendous pleasure that I welcome you to such an important educational event and to thank you for being with us today. I am Dr. Ahmed Fauzi, the cultural attaché and director of the Bureau. I would like to express my deepest thanks to Dr. Ashraf Al Azizi, head of the Egyptian Cultural Affairs and Missions Sector, uh, Dr. Haysam Hamza, head of the Missions Sector, Mr. Hisham Mustafa, General Director of the Mission Sector and all other colleagues within the sector for their continuous support and fruitful collaboration. Special thanks to Dr. Ahmed Haikal and all other colleagues working in the Egyptian Culture Bureau for their wonderful efforts. I would like also to express my gratitude to the University of Waterloo, our esteemed partner represented today by Dr. Ian Rollins, Professor and Vice President International, Dr. Jeff Castello, Professor and Associate Vice President Graduate Studies and Postdoctoral Affairs, Madame Janet Nugent, Associate Director Graduate Admissions, Madame Marianne Sim, Director GSPA, and Madame Ishari Ishari Wadwara Jayabahu, International relations manager. A big thank you as well to our Egyptian PhD scholars, Mr. Ahmed Hefni and Mr. Amr Matar, who are currently studying at the University of Waterloo for volunteering to participate in today's presentation. Now let me give you an overview of our bureau. Our bureau is uh, located in Montreal. It was established in the year 1986. It's located on the 10th floor in one plus Ville Marie. It used to be on the 19th floor in the same building till October, 2015. The main building, one plus Ville Marie was built in 1962. Its height is 188 meters and it has 47 floors. In terms of uh, the role of the Bureau, actually we have two key role aspects, educational and cultural. As for the educational role, our Bureau represents the Egyptian Ministry of Higher Education and Scientific Research in Canada. We tend to conduct several agreements with esteemed Canadian universities. We also uh, follow up on our Egyptian scholars uh, who are studying in the Canadian universities and schools. 
and we do some kind of authentication of educational documents for our Egyptian scholars. In terms of the cultural role, our bureau arranges a number of Egyptian cultural events to the Egyptian community there as well as the Canadians. Of course, before setting our vision and mission, we had to look at Egypt's vision 2030. This is the umbrella that uh, we are following and uh, pursuing. And from that uh, vision, and from, of course, the vision of uh, the Ministry of Higher Education and Scientific uh, Research in Egypt, we came up with our vision, which is to become Egypt's preeminent cultural and educational hub in Canada, as well as our mission, which is all about being a team passionately dedicated to fostering Egyptian cultural, educational, and scientific relations with our partners in Canada. We have three core values, which are imagination, collaboration, and determination. As for our team, our team includes Dr. Ahmed Haikal, the cultural attaché, Mrs. Heba Elmansi, administrative and financial attaché, Mr. Mustafa Shakib, executive secretary, Mrs. Marie Khouri, executive secretary, and myself, Dr. Ahmed Fauzi, cultural attaché and director. Now, I will leave the floor to Mr. Mustafa Shakib, who will talk to you about certain procedures that the Egyptian scholars should consider before and after their arrival to Canada. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Good afternoon. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to start greeting all the Egyptian students and the researchers attend the webinar by saying Ramadan. Karim and Iftar Makbul and wishing all of them to can come to Canada by next year, inshallah. My name is Mustafa Shakib. I've been working at the Egyptian Culture and Education Bureau for over than 20 years. And I would like to thank Madam Janet Nugent, the Associate Director and the Graduate Admission for supporting all the Egyptian students before arriving to Canada and after settling in Canada too. Um, before the student arrived to Canada, there are five or four steps he has to do. The student have to get the acceptance letter from his supervisor. Our bureau will generate the financial support letter and send it to his supervisor. A student must fill, fill the application form online and send all the documents to his university. After receiving the final acceptance from the university, a student must send the acceptance to us and our bureau will send the admission to the CDM. Next, please. Dr. Ahmed, next. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. After arriving in Canada, a student must send to us the following documents. Photocopy of his passport, a student visa, exit stamp from Cairo International Airport, bank account, and in same day, our bureau will transfer his salary and his allowance. For the, for the insurance, there is, for the insurance for joint supervision and postgraduate student, if the university doesn't cover the medical insurance, you will need to enroll for private insurance company. Thank you very much. Next, and thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Thank you, Dr. Fauzi and uh, Mr. Mustafa for this presentation. And uh, now it is our pleasure and honor to have today the elite university, University of Waterloo. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, colleagues. And thank you very much for the invitation to present to you today and to engage in the conversation. My name is Ian Rowlands, and I'm Associate Vice President International at the University of Waterloo. 
I'm also a professor in the School of Environment, Resources and Sustainability. At Waterloo, I have administrative research and teaching interests in areas of energy management, sustainability, and international relations. I've been at Waterloo for 23 years now. And before that, I worked at a UN agency in Denmark and worked at a university in the United Kingdom. I've got a PhD in international relations from the London School of Economics, and I did my bachelor's degree in applied science at the University of Toronto. And let me say again how much of a pleasure it is to be here with you and to be with my colleague, Professor Jeff Casello, to deliver a session about the University of Waterloo. Dr. Casello and I will go back and forth a couple of times as we provide an overview of the University of Waterloo, its distinguishing characteristics and its engagement with the world, and in particular, its outstanding opportunities for graduate students. And we'll be happy to come back to any issues during the question and answer period at the end. Go ahead, next slide, please. As you get an understanding of our university during this presentation, you'll, we hope you'll get a sense of its values. And inclusivity is a priority for us at Waterloo. So to our communities, present, past, and future. Thus, as many Canadian institutions do now, we take this opportunity to honor the land and the Indigenous heritage of the place on which both Dr. Casello and I are located today. The University of Waterloo acknowledges that much of our work takes place on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee's peoples. Our main campus is situated on the Haldeman Track, the land promised to the Six Nations that includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. Our active work towards reconciliation takes place across our campuses through research, learning, teaching, and community building. Can I have the next slide, please? On the center of the map that you'll see in front of you is where the university is located. It's in Waterloo, which is a metropolitan area of approximately 600,000 people located in the southern part of Canada and located in Ontario, which is Canada's most populous province. The map shows you that we've got close proximity to a number of major urban centers in North America. And what the map doesn't show you, and I'll share with you now, is that we also have immediate access to a number of green spaces and locations of outstanding beauty. Many of us value both the urban and the rural settings, and we feel that we have the best of both worlds here in Waterloo. And while we can't be on campus right now because of local health conditions, we wanted to give you a sense of what the campus is about. So if we can go to the next slide, and we're going to take just a second to bring up a, a video, which gives everyone on the webinar today a brief visual introduction to the University of Waterloo. So my colleague will start the video. And we are built for change. We are researchers united across disciplines and entrepreneurs advancing innovations. We are students working together to challenge the status quo, where leaders connect to the best and brightest talent. We are a global community who drive meaningful, sustainable, economic and social solutions. Through the power of partnership, we unlock new possibilities to transform ideas to inventions, curiosity to action, and imagination to impact. We don't fear the unknown. We thrive on opportunity to create, explore, and push boundaries. We are the University of Waterloo where collaboration drives the greatest impact. Let's build the future together. Wonderful, thank you for that. And uh, we hope that gives you a bit of a sense of what life on the campus of the University of Waterloo is about. And as the slides come back on, you'll see that on the on the next this stage, is Waterloo. a number of- With more than half a million residents. 
a number of pictures there which demonstrate more of our, our life and our environs. And I'll just encourage you when you uh, to have a look at the tour in the upper left on your own time and gives you a graduate student's perspective. And we can go to the next slide, please. A little bit about the facts and figures of Waterloo. We are a community of more than 40,000 people, our faculty, our students, our staff. We are a fairly young university, just over 60 years old, and we're active across a range of areas. And the next slide, please, shows you the, the faculties in which we organize our work. We've got an arts faculty home to our humanities, social sciences, and creative arts scholars. We've got engineering ranked among the top 50 engineering schools in the world. And it has expertise across a range of subdisciplines, the traditional subdisciplines of engineering to the most recently developed ones. Environment, we've got Canada's largest and most comprehensive environment faculty with an integrated balance of programs in both natural and social sciences, looking at both the built and natural environment. We have a health faculty that's committed to improving the life for individuals and communities through innovative education and research. We've got a faculty of mathematics, a single faculty devoted to the study of mathematics, theoretical and applied, and bringing together expertise in the areas of mathematics, statistics, and computer science. And then in science, we cover the traditional and foundational areas of science, as well as our specialized schools of optometry and vision science and pharmacy as well. Could we have the next slide, please? And if those faculties look at the educational opportunities, it's our centers and institutes that cut across these areas that really address the outstanding opportunities and challenges that are out there. And indeed, as we were introduced to the 10 main core fields that are the focus for, for much of this conversation, I found resonance with many of the areas that are addressed, not only in our faculties, but in our centers and institutes here. Words like environment, water, energy, technology, biotechnology, quantum, artificial intelligence, and the list goes on. Wonderful synergy with the, uh, again, as I said, the challenges and opportunities in the world today. I'll come back to research when I have a second go around in some introductory comments. But with the next slide, please, I think I'll pass it over to my colleague, Professor Casello. Thank you so much, Ian, and thank you everyone for being with us today and for this opportunity to share a little bit about the University of Waterloo. I'm going to have uh, an opportunity to talk to you twice, as did Professor Rollins. Um, in this section of the program, I will be happy to tell you why we think Waterloo can differentiate itself from our peer institutions in Canada and indeed globally. And then in the second part of my conversation with you today, I'll talk to you more about the unique elements of Waterloo that we think makes it a very attractive place for you to be a graduate student. Um, but before I do that, let me introduce myself a little bit. My name is Jeff Casello. I'm the Associate Vice President for Graduate Studies and Postdoctoral Affairs. So in that role, I lead the team at the university that looks after all of the graduate elements, graduate studies and graduate student elements from admissions to scholarships, to record keeping, um, to your academic progression and so on. So it's a really very powerful and very um, incredible opportunity for me to have to share with my colleagues at the university. As a professor, I teach in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, as well as in the School of Planning at Waterloo. Uh, my degrees are from the University of Pennsylvania in the United States. I am American and came to Canada just uh, 17 years ago with my family and have very much made Canada my home. So again, it's great for me to be here in Canada. It's great to have the chance to chat with all of you about the University of Waterloo. So let me share with you a couple of minutes on, on why the University of Waterloo. You may have seen in the video that we shared with you something that we are exceptionally proud of, Waterloo's academic excellence. We've always known about it, but now I think the world is beginning to really take notice. We were incredibly pleased when our colleague and friend, Donna Dr. Strickland, won the Nobel Prize in 2018 for her work on lasers and their application to health. And so this Nobel Prize winning event certainly drew a lot of attention. As I said, the world had known, but maybe know a bit better now. Um, I just share with you on the right side of this slide, some US News and World Report subject rankings. So you'll see that the strength lies, as you may be aware, in electrical engineering and computer science, but also in places like energy and fuels in mathematics and nanotechnology and outside of the hard physics and chemistry and and engineering. We're also well known for our social sciences and our public health, ranking number 126 in the world on those, um, on those 
categories of social sciences in public health. Why Waterloo? Well, we consider ourselves to be a very interdisciplinary and an institution that is proud, prides itself on innovation. One area of interest that I also noticed on the, um, on the introduction that we were provided on the 10 areas of focus for the scholarship program is around water resources and the environment. We have a collaborative water program that is offered across 11 academic institutes. So if you are a biologist interested in water quality, a civil engineer interested in water quality, if you are a public policy person or an urban planner interested in water quality, you will be grouped together as part of this collaborative water programming and sharing the opportunity to study with people in your discipline, but also with attention to improving the world's water quality. We also have, I think as Ian will talk about a bit more later, but we have an incredible creator own intellectual property policy at the University of Waterloo. And we have incubators that support our student entrepreneurs. So if your goal is to come to Waterloo and create new knowledge, but translate that new knowledge into something that is marketable or tangible or exportable, Waterloo is a unique place in terms of your ownership of those things. We are very interested in our graduate students, not only their learning, but also their careers. So graduate studies and postdoctoral affairs, the area that I lead, as I mentioned, has been working to build a brand of grad impact. We want to facilitate for you the opportunity to be impactful in your field of discipline. And the example there on the left is a, um, the result of one of our masters of data science and artificial intelligence who created a, their own company called JE Motions. Um, and you can read there some more about that program. But more generally, we are very eager to support graduate students in their professional development. So we run, pro one, run academic programming on things that we call grad flicks and grad talks. These are places where students improve their communication skills, improve their ability to, to communicate their research and their learning in ways that are really useful for them if they wish to enter into the professional careers inside or outside of the academy. At Waterloo, we are globally known for our cooperative or experiential learning opportunities. This is the balance of working and learning while you are a student. And we do this also at the graduate, at the graduate level for our institution. So we have complete co-op programs as the Master of Public Service, one that you see here on the screen. But there is a variety of ways in which students can be engaged both academically and professionally during their studies. We also engage meaningfully with external partners on research. So we have about 240 million, almost $250 million in graduate funding that comes from our external partners that help support graduate students as they do transformative research at the University of Waterloo. So that's a very quick look at why Waterloo, what are the highlights? I'll turn it back to Ian now and I'll be pleased to come back to you to tell you a bit more about um, specific reasons and specific strengths of the institution in just a little bit. So Ian, back to you, please. Great, thank you very much, Jeff. And I'd like to spend just a few minutes describing the internationalization elements of Waterloo and showing how we have a global reach and indeed are infused with global perspectives on our campus as well. Many times when we think about the ways in which universities internationalize, we reflect across three dimensions. A first one is the inbound element, that is international students coming in, international faculty coming in, international visitors coming in. And as this slide in front of you shows, we've got about a quarter of our student population are international students coming from outside of Canada. And about 30% of, of our faculty are international. Almost 400 of them have an international citizenship. And with regard to international delegations, when we're able to travel, it's certainly the case that we have a vibrant um, visitor community on our campus. And now that we're not traveling, we still in the virtual world have much engagement with the world. Go ahead, next slide, please. A second area is thinking about the opportunity for our students to go outbound and looking at the ways in which our undergraduate students do traditional academic exchange at other universities globally, or do, as Jeff was mentioning, our cooperative education program have some opportunities for job studies abroad as well. Graduate students do much traveling internationally as well, often associated with their research program, conferences or field research, lab visits, and so on. And we support staff in their outbound mobility and their ability to learn through connections with world-class universities. And of course, the faculty will have many connections through their research programs. 
More than half of our faculty did at least one of their degrees internationally. And I think you've already heard that both Jeff and I did at least uh, one of our degrees outside of Canada. So we're bringing those connections as well. Could I have the next slide, please? And a third area is our sustained connections, the ways in which our international linkages are beyond the, the individuals who are very important, but more than one individual on one trip or one member's activities. Instead, we have teams, we have labs, we have units, we have faculties, we have the university as a whole connecting with other parts of the world, building sustained infrastructure that can serve to support student experience, outstanding research discovery, and so on. This may be in terms of international agreements with other universities or bodies. It may be in terms of joint laboratories. It may be in terms of funding we get from international funders. It may be in terms of our alumni who act as our ambassadors around the world. If we go into the next slide, this drills down into some of those connections internationally, particularly the research ones. And Jeff has already spoken a bit about this, our outstanding research strength across so many of the areas of interest to this audience. As you've got this relatively busy slide in front of you, I'll highlight three things in particular. One is our, our researchers are very well qualified. The faculty and the students are doing well in provincial, national, global competitions for grants and awards. A second one is the environment is conducive to innovation, discovery, and creation. The intellectual property right regime that Jeff referred to really stimulates those who want to put time and effort into their ideas, working individually or collaboratively with others as well. And impact is the third area I'll identify. From curiosity-driven research through to applied in research, uh, we've got our, our students, our staff, our faculty uh, affecting the world in positive ways through their innovation, through their discovery. Go ahead, next slide, please. I'd like to share with you just a couple of words about our, our rich and many connections with Egypt as well. Um, the people. Uh, we've got there that three faculty members have uh, identified their citizenship uh, as Egyptian, and we've got a number of more faculty members who have Egyptian connections through heritage, past studies, so on and so forth. I've written there more than 60 students. We have a community of Egyptian students uh, to which uh, members of the group on this webinar may be joining. And within that, you've got the broader communities of African students, Middle Eastern students as well. So earlier slides talked broadly about those international connections we have. I just want to, as our speakers at the beginning of the session, we're talking about the rich history of connection between Waterloo and Egypt manifests itself not only in the continued uh, participation of individuals on our campus, but our sustained links, the alumni we're in touch with in, in Egypt, um, the co-authored publications that are being produced every year as well. If we go to the next slide, please, uh, talks a little bit about Waterloo's strategic research priorities and those 100 plus re research and article connections on the previous slide, many of them are finding expression through these research areas. And again, as I think back on the 10 main core fields, a lot of overlap with the ones presented here as well. We've got a couple of um, partnership agreements, obviously with our our valued partners uh, from Egypt and uh, helping to catalyze and facilitate this session here as well. If we could have the next slide, please. We're really excited to build upon our, our connections with Egypt and indeed the world. And I've got a couple of slides here that are, I guess, a more general message to those who are on the webinar today. In a couple of moments, I'll pass it back to Jeff who will do the deep dive on the graduate student experience and the processes associated with that. These couple of slides are maybe for the more general audience. And just if there's anyone tuning in today who's interested in finding out more about how they might connect with Waterloo, I'll just remind them that we've got more than 40,000 members who are effectively running their own internationalization programs. And each of them has potentially ways of engaging with you. We've got more than 100 units who have their own priorities under the broad Waterloo umbrella as well, and there may be interesting synergies with what you're doing. Could we have the next slide, please? And at the university level, we've prioritized partnerships going forward. And the slide here identifies the ways in which we see collaboration and partnerships being really important for 
making a positive student experience for advancing discovery research and applied research as well. So there's means by which we want to uh, advance our partnerships. And the next slide gives you an introduction to an organization that we call JEDI, which is our gateway organization for enterprises to discover innovation at Waterloo. Again, a message to the broad audience out there, we do have a one-stop shop where you can connect with us to see whether the, the idea you're interested in pursuing more, there might be ways to engage with Waterloo. And on the next slide and last one from me is simply a slide about the team I lead at Waterloo International. And if there's ever any questions about internationalization that don't feel, that don't fall into one of the areas that others have identified, it's an open invitation to reach out to me. And I'm delayed that my email address will be along with Jeff's on one of the last slides you see today. But with that, Jeff, I'll pass it back to you. Great, thanks so much, Ian, for that. Um, got about, I'll try to wrap up in uh, 12, 13 minutes here to make sure that there's plenty of time for our students to join us and also for questions and answers at the end. So let me just pick up where, where Ian left off and tell you more specifically about our graduate programs. We have about 180 graduate programs at the university. And those graduate programs are offered at three levels. One can be a course-based master's student. In those programs, you take a series of courses, typically about eight courses, and you finish a master's degree. We also have research master's programs where you come to us, you take probably between four and six courses, you then complete either a major research paper or a thesis and you earn your research-based master's degree. And of course, we have our PhD programs. The breakdown amongst our faculties here in terms of rough numbers are we have about a thousand students in the Faculty of Arts and you can see there the values. So predominantly we have the largest number of students in our Faculty of Engineering um, with smaller numbers in the remaining faculties, all about between 650 and 1100 graduate students. And overall, we have about 6,100 graduate students at the university, 2,100 of which are enrolled in these course-based programs, and about 4,000 are enrolled in research programs. So how do you find the right graduate program? Uh, this starts with a little bit of a question for yourselves. Um, what do you hope to achieve by coming back to, to graduate school? If your intention is to simply improve your skills and to make yourself potentially more marketable in your current discipline, then maybe a course-based master's program is the right pathway for you. If you intend to do research, of course, then you have to think about um, one of our research programs, either a research master's or the PhD program. And certainly the question that we'd like students to think about is what impact do you hope to have? So when you come to us, our goal really is to help you achieve what it is you want to achieve. And so we ask that when you are thinking about coming to Waterloo, ask yourself at the end, what is it that you hope to achieve? What, where do you see yourself personally and professionally at the end of your graduate program? Because this will really help you, I think, um, pick the right program for you. And of course, you have to match your skills and your background to the programs we're offering. So if you are very quantitatively apt, then probably a mathematics or an engineering or a science program makes sense to you. If you are uh, more on policy and, and more of a qualitative student, then maybe we are think you might be thinking more about the social sciences or the humanities. I provide this link here for you, and this is a really good um, video that we've created to help students work through the thought process that this slide is intended to, um, to trigger for you so that you can think about what your skills are, what your interests are in the way that you would normally approach problems. And that will be good guidance, we think, for you to help find the right program. Once you've given this some thought, I think this is another place that we'll direct you to. So this link here lists all of our graduate programs. And the, again, the way that I would like for you to think about this is what is it that you'd like to study? So are you thinking about climate change? And if you're thinking about climate change, are you thinking about that from a scientific point of view, from an engineering point of view, from a policy point of view? And these two things together will help you find the right program. And again, this link on the right hand side will direct you to all of our academic programs and we'll give you an overview of each. And I think these slides will be available to you after the webinar today. So you'll be able to click this link and follow along. And hopefully this page is useful for you as you begin to think about which program you'd like to be engaged with. And of course, the next question is, if you're in a research program, who will serve as your supervisor? This relationship between our graduate students and our supervisor is incredibly important for us. This is really the strength of our graduate programs for our research student. And so we really think it's important that you find the right supervisor. So how do you do that? Well, 
The easiest way, I think, for to find a faculty member with whom you may wish to work is to look on our departmental web pages. So the university is organized into departments, and each of those departments have profiles of all of our faculty members. So on the right here, I show you Professor Rollins. And if you were to visit his profile, you would get a link to his CV. You would get a quick statement of his research interests and so on. And so you would really get a very good sense of uh, the things in which Professor Rollins is interested in and is currently conducting research on. And of course, his contact information is here. So if you discover Professor Rollins as someone with whom you might want to work, you can certainly reach out to them and start that conversation even before you apply to the university. The other way to find out is many of our faculty colleagues have research-based web page. So this is mine, the Waterloo Public Transportation Initiative. This is what I study. And if you were to search this, you would find a web page that we've created that tells you not only the things that we're working on, but also what our students are doing. What are they working on? Where, do, where have they gone on as alumni? and what kind of publications and so on, and who are our project partners. So these are two really good ways for you to find faculty members or programs that will work. Um, and certainly you can look through scholar.google.com or other venues to see what people at Waterloo are publishing. Um, and that will give you also a really good sense of what the faculty members are working on. So how do you apply? That link at the top really gives you very good guidance on the steps, but the Key dates are here, um, and we saw a little bit about how these interact with the, um, with the um, scholarship program and the dates. And of course, we're eager to have flexibility to ensure that our colleagues, uh, our student applicants, have every opportunity to be admitted under the scholarship program. So the dates here, I think, are guidelines, but if there are opportunities for us to collaborate to ensure that you are considered for admission, we'll, we'll certainly do that. At Waterloo, um, we operate on three terms. So our first term is just coming to an end. That was January till the end of April. Our second term begins in early May and goes till the end of July. And our third term of the year goes from September to the end of the calendar year in December. We mostly admit students for the fall term beginning in September, but we do have other admissions um, times for the institution. The deadline to have applied to one of our graduate programs is typically February 1st, but again, there may be some flexibility if you are applying through the scholarship program. And our colleague Jeanette, uh, who you've met already today, um, she is the point of contact for admissions questions. She is um, all knowledgeable. So please, if there's any questions about your admission status, um, you can certainly reach directly out to Jeanette. So for students applying from Egypt, this is just some background um, on what the minimum admission requirements are. And I should be clear to say that these are minimum admission requirements. So um, let me be, be honest and say that just by meeting these doesn't necessarily mean that you will be admitted. But if you don't meet these, you will not be admitted. So I think that these are sort of the uh, minimum requirements, but don't guarantee admissions. So your overall academic standing must be very good on, a, on the 3.0 out of, out of the 4.0 scale or, or with letter grades a B. Um, you must have demonstrated other superior qualifications. So you must demonstrate the ability to conduct research. And of course, we have English uh, language proficiency that I'll talk more about in just, uh, just a moment. So when you're applying, it's important that you let us know that you are applying under this international agreement. And here's a screen capture from the application portal and will allow you there to choose the Egypt um, Government of Egypt doctoral program if that's the program that you are applying to. So here are our English language proficiency requirements. So across the, the um, programs that we have. So you can use TOEFL as a qualifying, you can use the IELTS as a qualifying, and these are the scores that you um, have to achieve. We also have English for Academic Success um, at the University of Waterloo. So this is a program that if you are otherwise academically qualified, but you don't meet the English language program, we have a pathway for you to join us at Waterloo and to concentrate your um, early time at Waterloo on improving your English language skills so that you can be um, academically successful and join us as a full-time student. How do you fund your studies? Well, um, you know, we're talking here today about, uh, about joining us as part of this scholarship program. So some of this is um, not entirely relevant, but I think that the key messages that we wanted to leave you with today is that we'll make very clear to you what the costs are going to be for you to be a graduate student at the University of Waterloo. We'll tell you the tuition. We'll give you a good idea of the housing costs. We will talk to you about insurance and living expenses. So those things will be 
clear to you. And of course, those things will be um, covered in part by your scholarship if you are admitted through the um, program that we're discussing today. Beyond the external funding programs, uh, for example, the government program we're talking about today, you may receive additional funding um, from your supervisor. You may be have opportunities to serve as teaching assistants where you help us deliver our courses. Um, you might also be engaged in some research um, with, with professors other than your direct supervisor. So these are all additional ways for you to fund your, um, fund your education at Waterloo. And I wanna make clear too that we also have this emergency support. So for our international students, if you experience unforeseen financial challenges, we do have programs to help support you those. In the past, we've had students, for example, whose families have experienced illness and immediately need some financial support to travel home unexpectedly. And the university is well prepared to handle those kinds of requests from our students. So what about our community? Um, we're very proud of the safe and inclusive and diverse community that we, are, that we are part of at the University of Waterloo. We have, of our graduate students, about 40% of them are international from uh, over 60 countries around the world. Uh, we have a, remark, a remarkable set of diverse interests, cultures, communities, and it's exceptionally safe at the University of Waterloo. Um, we provide on-campus housing for our students, but we also, there is also, um, a whole host of housing available in the community. And to be perfectly candid, the housing is um, typically around the university and is very well received by our graduate students. And so I really wanted to convey to you the importance of having a safe and really pleasant experience. If you are having academic troubles that are a result of medical conditions or of your wellness, the university has an accessibility services office. The goal of this office is to help those students who are experiencing those kinds of challenges. And what can come from the accessibility services office is, for example, the kinds of things that you see on the screen. You might be able to get some, for example, assistive technology. So if you have a hearing impairment, you might get some help recording lectures. If you have a visual impairment, you might get some help having lecture notes read to you. If you need support from your peers, you can receive that through accessibility services and other academic elements. So if you need just a little bit longer to be successful on your, on your exams, that can be accommodated also through accessibility services. What else do we do in turn to support our international graduate students? Well, we certainly provide excellent immigration support through our student success office. So if you're trying to come to Canada, we help with that. If you are trying to get a post-graduation work permit to stay in Canada to work professionally, we help with that. We have an English language institute that is intended to support you not only in your transition, but to continue your support for your English language improvement. And that includes also our writing and communication center. The university, as I mentioned before, is really interested in your professional development. We have a suite of programs under the grad venture umbrella. This is a whole host of programs, again, that we run to help you find jobs in and outside of the academy. Um, so if you wanna be a professor, if you wanna work for a consulting firm, you can work on your professional development skills. The Center for Career Action helps with building your resume, helps with mock interviews if you are thinking about getting a job. So these are things that, again, are really intended to help you find professional opportunities while you're with us as students and after your time with students. I just will end with a couple of messages about the way that the university perceives our graduate students. At Waterloo, we really say this and we mean it, that students are at the center of all that we do. We really work hard. Um, the, I think the reputation for the University of Waterloo is that it's a very rigorous institution. That we operate our academics at a very high level. And I think that's true, but we are learning and we are taking meaningful steps to make sure that the academic rigor that we are operating under is also balanced with the academic excellence and student wellness. We are directing lots of energy now towards making sure our students have every opportunity to be successful, both personally and professionally. And as I mentioned before, we are really eager to create a community where Canadian citizens learn from their international counterparts and their international students learn from our Canadian colleagues. We want to graduate not only really excellent students who have conducted fantastic research and have achieved their academic goals, but who are globally aware, who understand cultures and heritages from around the world. That's incredibly important for us at Waterloo. You know, the university's goals just to finalize are to engage you in transformative scholarship to achieve your goals. And I guess it's a little bit simple to say that the university goals are your goals. We want you to tell us what you want to achieve and we'll do everything in our power to help you get there. 
So that's our message from the university. Um, again, here is our contact information. Um, I think, Ian, um, that wraps it up for us and we're right on time at 4 p.m. I will end by saying Ramadan Mubarak. I want to wish you all the happiest of the holy month. And with that, I will turn it back to our colleagues and we'll see what is next uh, on the uh, agenda for today. Am I correct um, in understanding that our students will be coming next? Thank you, Jeff. Yes, uh, for sure. We introduce now Mr. Ahmed Hanafi. Please, uh, Mr. Ahmed. Yeah, hi, Jeff. How are you doing? Can you can see me? Yes. Perfect. Okay, just uh, sharing my screen. Um, good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm very glad actually to uh, get this uh, such kind of opportunity to participate in that uh, uh, great event. And uh, first of all, I just need to um, express my gratitude to my home country for giving me that kind of uh, scholarship and grant to be a part of that great community as a, as a student of University of Ferrello. Uh, actually, before going to mention why I'm choosing University of Ferrello to get to pursue my PhD degree. I just need to uh, mention about, actually when I secured my grant from the mission sector in Egypt in, in 2019, uh, uh, I was going to United States of America, but for some reason I just changed my mind and changed my destination to Canada. And right now I can just say, I, uh, I believe I did and I took the right decision for coming here to University of Ferrello because reverse real, real law is it's one of the globally topic uh, top ranking university all over the world. And also uh, it had a great location, it had a great city. So right now uh, I'm just giving some uh, reason for choosing University of Ferrello. This is apart from a uh, scientific reason and academic reason. I'm just going to talk about the city and the reason for uh, uh, that make Wuchen law like a different city. Actually, there's like many reasons, a long list that we can mention about uh, what makes Wuchen Law different, but I'm just going to focus on only three points. The first one is great location for the University of Ferrello, which is located in a great city, which is called Wuchen Law. And uh, this, that city, it actually it's offered like uh, an urban and the country living uh, with a suburban neighborhood and new building in the, down, in the downtown core, and also, it's, uh, it's offered like joys of a small town life with a, with a large town amenities, which is a great uh, feature to living in, in such a kind of city. And second point is University of uh, City of Warlow, it's, it's the home for a three high ranking institution, which is University of Warlow and uh, uh, Wolfred Dury University and Conestoga College. And for that, of course, you can increase your communication with other people from different communities, which is a, a great chance and a great advantage for people to come here in Waterloo. And second point is the diversity in University of Ferrello, as mentioned by Dr. Uh, Casello, which said University of Ferrello, we have like uh, more than 40% of people coming from more than 60 uh, uh, countries all over the world. So that kind of advantage will give you the opportunity to express like different kinds of food and different kind of things and different different kind of culture and also it will offer like a multicultural and welcoming uh, community with amazing foods all over the world and the last point i will be mentioned in my presentation which is there are, there are like many places and parks in city of Warlow. you can just go you can just go for for, for a picnic with your family members and this is a great chance so firstly, I just said the greater chance because Waterloo City is so near from different uh, cities, especially from Toronto, because we have like one hour uh, far away from Toronto. So you can just go with your family member, like one hour by, by your own car, you can just go for Toronto, you can just go for Niagara Falls, which is one of the uh, uh, magnificent uh, uh, land, uh, land, uh, land markets in uh, Ontario. And also for the diversity, as I mentioned before, for uh, the food courts, the University of Waterloo offers like many and a large number of restaurants and cafe. 
if you're uh, either in, uh, on campus or off campus, you can go and check like different kinds of foods and you can find your food of interest. And for us, for in the Middle East or for the Arab, Arab countries, we are very interested in halal food. So we can find the mini stores uh, around, around the main campus and also uh, around the city. And finally, for the, uh, for the facilities or outgoing facilities, you can find many, uh, many uh, parks and, uh, and places. You can just go and, jo and uh, uh, join uh, your family member. You can just uh, get some fresh airs. You can just go for, uh, we have Waterloo Park, which is known as the jewelry of the city. And we have also uh, other park, which is called the Victoria Park. You can go and can check and join, uh, enjoy uh, the landscapes, the green, the green landscapes and like many places and the playgrounds for kids and like other many places to join. Uh, this is like a small part that this is small, small points. I, I just want to mention about University for a Law and City for a Law. So I'm just encouraging uh, my Egyptian colleagues to choose University for a Law just to pursue uh, their degrees here because of course, once you join University for a Law, you will have the chance to uh, get like uh, many courses and other things just to improve uh, your uh, uh, professional and transferable skills that are more relevant to the modern work environment and you will be more qualified to go for the future. So I just guarantee for all of us, we, can, we will get like a fruitful future once you join University for a Law. Thank you so much for, for listening and for your time. And I'm very glad to answer any question from all people. And you can uh, contact me with my email and uh, just to answer any question. Thank you so much for that. Thank you, Ahmed, for uh, this uh, presentation. And uh, now I would like to introduce Amr Matar. He's Amr. OK, thank you, uh, Professor Ahmed. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Amr Matar. Uh, I am a PhD student at uh, Electrical and Computer engineering department at the University of Waterloo. I am now in my fourth year in, PhD, in, B, in my PhD. Uh, I want to say that uh, during the previous three years, I enjoy living in Waterloo and uh, have a lot of good experience with the University of Waterloo. So I encourage everyone to, especially in engineering field, because the University of Waterloo is ranked to one of the top university in the field of engineering. So today I will just uh, give a small talk about about two points. One of the point is uh, Professor Casello uh, says that uh, when you come to the university, one of the points that you need to be aware is about the housing cost and what is the uh, cost of the house. And one of the other point is uh, about uh, living expenses, like food, uh, what is the price of food and something like that. So my, my presentation is very small. I will just give you links so you can explore uh, multiple things. So uh, for housing, you have two options. Usually there is a uh, campus housing and it is very uh, unique and wonderful. And one of the point is uh, off campus, like for example, for Kijiji and something like that. So I just like, For this point, like uh, for campus housing, I just try to do. Um, if you open uh, the website, you should uh, stop the share. Yeah. And the website, yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, so this is campus housing. As you can see, there is a multiple of options. You can go through this uh, link and you will see uh, all these privileges. Of course, uh, some uh, places are reserved for undergraduate and some places are reserved for graduate students. And the graduate students, sometimes there is, uh, there is places, for example, like uh, Columbia Lake Village South. It is reserved only for, uh, it's reserved for graduate students with family and uh, for North, it is reserved for, uh, sorry, uh, Columbia Lake Village is reserved for uh, graduate students with families and 
Cyrus is for fourth year final years undergraduate and graduate students. So, like for example, my uh, colleague Ahmed Hifni is. I think there's a problem in uh, on the connection. I'm afraid so. Yes, our internet here in Waterloo region has been spotty. Um, I don't know where Mr. Matar is, um, but it may be that he is experiencing internet problems. Yeah. Okay, should we uh, go for the question and answer session? I'm happy to begin if that's uh, if that's what's useful. Yes. Okay. So uh, we start now the question and answer session. If any one of you have any question, please write that down in the Q and A box. So I will start immediately. Okay. Is there is a question from Manar asking, is there is a program for Arabic lecture and the creative writing? Should I have a license of fine arts to apply for such a program? Not sure who, um, who's best served to answer that one. Uh, I don't think we have um, um, an Arabic writing um, program at Waterloo. That's my understanding, but Jeanette will know better than I do. Um, so maybe Jeanette, you can you can join us and answer that question. For Thank sure. You for <laughs> You're correct, Jeff. Unfortunately, we do not have that actual program. We do have um, our English language literature programs, other creative writing programs that you may want to look into under our Faculty of Arts. Mm -hmm. So with another question, is there is any available medical scholarship in the university for IG undergrad? So you're asking about uh, undergraduate program, if he is graduated from the IG, is there any um, scholarship in medicine school? So I'll just give a, a quick reaction. In, in some sure. countries of the world, medical studies is a first degree. In, mm -hmm. in Canada, medical studies is a a second degree. So uh, one usually does in back in the day, it was two or three years, perhaps it's a full undergraduate degree and then pursues a, a medical uh, degree. Uh, at Waterloo, we have a health faculty. Uh, we don't have a medical school, but we certainly do uh, collaborate with our, our colleagues who are in medical schools. And a lot of our innovation across all of our faculties have medical applications as well. Okay. There's another question from Labib asking about um, a PhD program in physical therapy. Great, yes. Yeah. So um, again, under our Faculty of Health, we have the uh, program Kinesiology, um, which would be something similar that uh, the student may be interested in. Um, I'm not sure if there's anything else you want to indicate there, Jeff. Um, yeah, so our, our kinesiology program produces uh, graduates who are well prepared to enter as physical therapists. That's the um, that's the job that many of our um, our graduates program graduate students in that program would end up uh, having. Uh, many of our of our graduates from that program work with really high profile positions, um, whether with professional sports teams and so on. So this is a, a very good program that a student who's interested in physical therapy should look into our kinesiology program in the Faculty of Health. So there's another question asking about uh, nursing, especially pediatric nursing. Um, so again, in our Faculty of Health, we uh, do have uh, health-related programs. So they would be like Master of Public Health, uh, Master of uh, Health Evaluation. Um, those kinds of, uh, of programs may be of interest. We don't have a, a nursing school at the University of Waterloo. Um, mm -hmm. And 
for um, for full transparency, I'll, I'll maybe uh, identify the University of Western Ontario or Western University, sorry, where there is a very good nursing school in Canada. So if a colleague is interested in nursing, um, I would direct them towards um, towards Western as a place to do their studies. Mm -hmm. See, it's not always all about Waterloo. We try to be friendly with our neighbors too. Okay. From Heba, she asked about fine arts and interior design, architecture, and the graphic design. Yeah, I think I can take that one, Jeanette, and you sure. can help if, there, if there's a... So we have a, an architecture program that is in the Faculty of Engineering. So if you are um, wish to be trained as a professional architect, certainly the um, uh, Faculty of Engineering, the architecture program is there. There's also an architectural engineering program now. So if you are very much interested in the in the engineering elements of architecture, that's a good program for you as well. Um, we also have a fine arts program in our Faculty of Arts that does quite a lot in design. And then there is the program that operates out of our um, satellite campus in Stratford, Ontario, that is a Master's of Digital Arts. Um, so this is um, a program that is intended for digital art creation and also a very popular and, and well-subscribed program. Okay. Uh, and there's a question asking about, uh, is there is any media related PhD program? PhD program for media? So Jeanette, I think I'll, I'll leave that one to you. Sure, yeah. So under our um, English program, we do have um, the MA in Literary Studies, MA in Rhetoric and Communication Designs, and we also have our English PhD. And under the PhD, the research fields are Experimental Digital Media, GINs, uh, Literary Theory and Discourse Analysis, and Rhetoric. Mm -hmm. Hope that helps. Mm -hmm. So there is another question from Manar. I am not a student in the Faculty of Fine Arts, so I think I should apply for English uh, undergrad program. I am right. And I am teaching assistant in the field of uh, food processing, quality and safety faculty of fishing science. So I don't, I don't understand. <laughs> yeah, maybe I can take a try at that question. I think, um... When a student comes to us and they have a background that's very different than the mm -hmm. student than the background they wish to pursue as a graduate student. So if your undergraduate is in engineering and you wish to come and study fine arts, um, we will sometimes offer you what we call a conditional admission. Um, and essentially now we say, you know, academically you are qualified to be a student at Waterloo, but your background isn't exactly right for the program you're applying to. So we'll admit you into that program and we will make sure that you are going to be successful in that program before you become a full-time student in that program. So there is this ability for students to transition from one background to another background. So if a student is interested in, in taking up a discipline that is very different than what their undergraduate degree is or what they've been working, their profession has been, then I think the, the right thing to do would be to reach out to us and we can, we can help guide you and, and help you make a decision about whether or not you'll be successful in the new program. Actually, Dr. Haysan Khalil asked a very important question. He asked, uh, what would the University of Waterloo accept our transcript directly without using WES evaluation or other evaluation organization? Correct. Uh, we do review um, applications that come from the Egyptian University. So when a student applies at the application stage, students just upload a copy of their transcript and degree certificate. Um, and so then we would evaluate it here at Waterloo. Um, if we did have any questions, we'd reach out to the student. Um, and then students that are accepted, then we would ask the student to arrange for official transcripts to be sent directly from the home university that we can evaluate without the West. We do the evaluation ourselves, right, Jeanette? We don't Correct. engage West. Yeah, okay. Right. Uh, I'm going to ask about what about a PhD in English teaching? So we don't have a um, we don't have an education school at the University of Waterloo. Mm -hmm. So when you finish our, our graduate programs, you wouldn't be credentialed to teach in Canada. Um, that's not to say that um, as a, a PhD graduate in um, from the university that you couldn't get a teaching job, but you wouldn't be prepared for a, for a um, wouldn't be prepared as if you had completed a teacher's college, um, but that wouldn't preclude you from entering into the academy, um, working at a community college and so on. So 
um, it's not directly a pathway to being a teacher in the conventional sense, but certainly teaching opportunities would exist with your PhD from Waterloo. Okay. There's another question uh, asking about, uh, should I have um, acceptance from a professor first before admission to a PhD program? In Waterloo? Sure. Um, so for this question, um, some departments do require that the student uh, secure a professor. Um, other departments will assign a supervisor later on in the program. So the student is more than uh, happy to research what programs we offer, reach out to those professors. We do have a website on um, you know, finding what research program that you're interested in and then uh, um, you know, apply for admissions. So, um, Jeff, you may want to add a few more things there from a yeah, if supervisor. I can. Yeah, so it's, um, as you can imagine, we get many, many applications for our PhD and for our master's programs. And the pathway is this, that the university receives those, and then we move them to the department, and then they get in front of potential supervisors. And so if you have made contact with a professional, with a, a potential supervisor beforehand, it's likely that your application will get a bit more attention potentially than if you haven't had a chance to talk with a professor before. So we always, we always recommend that students reach out to uh, potential supervisors. And I'll just give you a couple of tips about that. Um, we also get very many emails from potential students. And so the best way to get a, a, a potential supervisor's attention is to, first of all, know a little bit about their research area. And if you have read some of their papers, if you know something about their students and their current work, if that's part of the email, you're much more likely to get a response from a faculty member than if you simply um, reach out without any background. So if you have, found a supervisor that you're really interested in working with, then do a little bit of reading on their research, know something about the papers they've written, know something about the projects they've worked on, and include that in your email to that faculty member, and you're much more likely to get a response. Okay. Uh, There's a, a very important question to Jeanette. Can you help us in contacting the potential supervisor at Waterloo University? Can you introduce our students to the professor in Waterloo? For sure, if you, um, yeah, if the students uh, reach out to me with their area of research, you know, what department they're interested in, for sure, I can help them out to connect with the supervisor. Absolutely. So, yep, just reach out to me at uh, J Nugent. So, J N U G E N T. Can you write, please, in the chat box? Uh, yep, for sure, at uwiley.ca. So, yep, here we go. Yes. Thank you. Um... Okay, there is another question, question asking about uh, what is the average uh, acceptance rate of graduate student in engineering program? We ask about the average acceptance rate here. Yeah. yeah, it's difficult to say. Um, it varies year over year, of course, and it varies based on the, the individual supervisor that a person works with. Um, you know, it depends on whether or not, oftentimes, whether or not that supervisor is, is taking on new students, and that can be a function of um, how much financial support is available to the student and to the supervisor, but also how many students they are they are currently supervising. So I myself, and I think Professor Rollins, we are busy with administration. And so when we get students who are applying to us, um, we're very careful about, about the number of students that we'll take. We have other faculty colleagues who have phenomenal research programs that at times will have 15 or 20 graduate students working with them. So it really depends on a, on a supervisor by supervisor basis. But I can say this, if you are a well-qualified student who has interest that, that is shared by the supervisor and you are coming as part of a funded program, your chances are very good to get a very thorough review from that supervisor. So um, I think that's a, a fair way to say it. Maybe Ian, you wanna just add a couple of words. Thanks, Jeff. No, I, I'm happy to, and it's simply to endorse all that you've said as well. Very much uh, reinforce uh, you get another pers professor's perspective here. As you're scouting out potential supervisors, do have a look to see where your interests connect with that person's as well. And um, as, as Jeff and I and our colleagues read emails from others, um, from potential students, we really want to see that we're going to be able to provide a service and help you in your learning journey. 
And so uh, seeing how it fits in and uh, can contribute to the team and learn from the team will be very important. And I will reiterate the, the ways in which you've got the possibility of securing uh, resources from this scholarship program will be an important part of the calculus as well. Thanks for that, Jeff. Thank you. So um, there's a question asking about the daycare facility in Waterloo and if there is uh, available for low income students, yeah. So yes, um, we actually have a daycare bursary that is available to our PhD students. So if you demonstrate a financial need, we will help provide some. Um, um, it's not, um, I don't think it's the full cost of daycare, but it is some support from the university to help you cover the cost of your daycare. And um, I should say, I'll, I'll be a little bit, um, I'll brag a little bit about the university. We did win an award from the, the Canadian Association of Graduate Studies a couple of years ago for this award, our daycare bursary, and also our medical bursary and our parental leave program. So all of these are really very top of class compared to our peers. So we're very proud of the support we provide those students. Um, so yes, there is a daycare bursary and, um, and we're very proud of that uh, support that we provide to parents. Okay, there is another question asking about the IELTS score. So they ask about if we can get like conditional acceptance and some programs require the 7.5, which is very high. Is a low score could be accepted by the university if the supervisor accepts the student? Okay, so uh, we do have um, IELTS scores. They do vary depending on which program that you're applying to. So it does range from, um, uh, I have it right here, IELTS is between um, a 6.5, a 7, or a 7.5 overall. We do also have an excellent um, English for Academic Success program on campus through our Renison University College. So it's an intensive English program that students would take before um, taking their uh, graduate studies, and um, they would then be up to the level that is required in order to start um, their studies at Waterloo. Uh, okay, there is another question asking about um, the channel program. Uh, the student come only for one year to do research in uh, Waterloo as a research visitor. Okay, so can he join the UHIP uh, medical insurance in Waterloo? Um, not 100% sure in on this one. Yeah. Um, uh, my understanding is that when an international student joins us and they are um, officially enrolled um, for a program, so even if it is a, a one-year visit, um, then they are eligible for UHIP. Um, that's my understanding. But this is something that we should double check because it's mm -hmm. that important. So I, I, I will answer conditionally yes, but we will, we will make sure and get back to you. Okay. Uh, and there's another question uh, asking about... What the University of Waterloo accept our transcript? Okay, you answered this question before. So you're asking about French programs. Is there any French program available in Waterloo or especially for education programs? I know you, say, you said before that there is no education faculty in Waterloo, yeah? But is there any other French program or? Yes, so we do have a uh, French studies uh, program. Um, just grabbing it here for you um, under our Faculty of Arts. And mm -hmm. uh, that program, I can just tell you a little bit more about it here. Programs is um, French studies. We have a master's and a PhD. And um, that would be something that they would uh, have background in prior to applying. Yes, again, that, that's, um, these are research programs, right, in, mm -hmm. in French language, and so the, the goal there would be, I think, to conduct research predominantly in French, so it wouldn't be intended for those who wanted to become French grade school teachers, I don't think, that's not a good fit, but, um, but if you wanted to, again, conduct research or engage in scholarship um, around French language, French culture, those kinds of things, then, then this program is a very good fit for you. Uh, I think the final question with us today is, is the GRE required? And if not, does it give any privilege for the student to be accepted in Waterloo? For the GRE? 
Yeah. Um, there's a few graduate programs that uh, require the G GRE, some of the engineering, um, Masters of Engineering program. So again, it is up to each department what um, admission requirements are required there. Um, so again, they would just go to the program of interest and then they would see if it is required or not. Uh, I think we can... Uh answer the remaining question we can share with you and we get the feedback back to the student. Uh, so thank you for your attendance today and thank you for your time and your effort and thank you for everyone who are joining us today. Um, and now I will leave the floor for Professor Ahmed Fauzi uh, to say the final words today. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, I would like to thank uh, everyone for exerting the effort to take part in today's awesome educational uh, gathering. Uh, I would like again to thank our Egyptian uh, PhD scholars who are studying at the University of Waterloo uh, for their uh, informative uh, presentations. We are very proud of you. Thank you very much to all the attendees and I wish you all the best of luck and the best of success. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fauzi and uh, Mr. Hisham, if you would like to say. Uh... Uh, well, I appreciate the, the attendance uh, of Waterloo University. Uh, it was a great presentation to your programs. I'm sure that it helped a lot of our uh, uh, prospective uh, students. And uh, we are looking uh, much further for uh, much uh, cooperation with uh, Waterloo University. It has a great reputation in the Egyptian scholar community. And I wish that uh, uh, this announcement we send you a lot of uh, participants, inshallah, hopefully. Uh, Dr. Ahmed Faudi, uh, thank you very much for uh, giving us the chance to present uh, our announcement and uh, we appreciate your cooperation. Thank you very You're much. You're most welcome, Mr. Hashem. Thank you very much to you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay, I think uh, we are finished today and uh, have a nice evening and thank you for all. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks. <laughs>